just give you a, a, a very brief sense of who I am, so that you get to know my relationship to uh, your distinguished Professor Siegel and uh, to the field, to the discipline. Um, I've uh, been a professor uh, at the University of Minnesota, mainly for about 18 years in Jewish studies, and I've written uh, seven books and many articles in the, in the field of ancient Judaism. I have to say to you, just as an aside, that Professor Siegel, your professor, probably uh, way too modest, is really one of the leading scholars in the discipline. Uh, I've been at meetings uh, nationwide, and I can tell you his regard and respect is unsurpassed. And I also have read his books, and I enjoy, enjoy them immensely. Um, I'm going to, to talk today about the Pharisees, and I'm going to use the uh, PowerPoint uh, throughout the presentation, throughout the lecture. Uh, I also am going to try to introduce to you the historical sources. The, probably the most important one that is going to uh, be of concern to you as the course concludes and progresses is uh, the rabbinic uh, sources, the Mishnah, Tosefta, and Talmuds, which we'll come to at the end of, of the hour. Please feel free to uh, ask questions if you if you feel the need at any time. I'll, I'll stop and perhaps I'll ask you questions depending on how I feel. Uh, I want to just make a couple of references to your syllabus and to your uh, readings so that you know where to place this. Uh, the, the topic of Pharisees is, is the week of April 8th on your syllabus. And one of the readings on that that's a supplementary is from Politics to Piety by Jacob Neusner. Uh, I studied with Professor Neusner, and I'm going to use this particular source very uh, significantly in this lecture. Um, there's also a good deal of material that you might be associating with the week of April 15th on your syllabus, so there's going to be some overlap there as well. Uh, I want to make a note also that I saw on the end of the syllabus one of the suggested paper topics uh, regarding the Pharisees and uh, the rabbinic movement. What is the relationship between the rabbinic movement and the Pharisees? In what sense did one grow out of another? These are suggestions for paper assignments. I don't really know too much about how your paper assignments work, but your TAs are going to have all that information for you. Uh, under this, the uh, topic headings of Revolt and Restoration, pages 429 and following, and Mishnah, the New Scripture, pages 497 and following. So that should give you a little bit of a reference as to where you are in your course, and I have to give uh, Professor Siegel a lot of credit because he followed up on this rather judiciously and made sure that there was continuity. Uh, what I want to do today is pretty much self-contained, so that we, I hope to cover this ground and to give you a sense of, of the issue. And um, the issue, as you can see, is going to start out at least, who are the Pharisees? Uh, the, the main issue is not who are the Pharisees as much as how do we analyze the historical sources about the Pharisees? And um, what are those historical sources? That's me. The question to begin with is when? When are, when are we talking about? When did the Pharisees uh, 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 do their thing? When were they historically active? When were they of concern? Uh, this is in the period before 70 CE, a period that you're familiar with, and a period, of course, that Professor Siegel's uh, professional expertise is, is in as well. It's a time of the beginning of Christianity, it's a time of Roman governance in the land of Israel. Uh, it's a time of great political tension. And it's a time of religious effervescence. I think, as far as I'm concerned, I've always said this, if I could live in another century, I'd probably want to live in either the beginning of the 19th century or in the first century at uh, CE, because it was a time when lots of things were going on. The Pharisees, unfortunately, uh, I had to make a decision whether to use my laptop or whether to use the connected computer. The only difference is that you won't see the word Prushim in Hebrew. You'll see some other fun. 
But the Hebrew of Pharisees is prushim, which, which could mean a number of things. And I'm not going to go into those linguistic issues, but it usually is associated with the word separatists. However, the term Pharisees gets, a, gets to be a label. And it gets to be a label because of the culture that we live in, and that is the, uh, the culture of uh, Christianity, a Christian culture, a Western culture that's dominated by that, as a label, used as a, as a label to say, if you're a Pharisee, that means that you are strict in doctrine, that you are outwardly hypocritical, that you may be even self-righteous. And so obviously there's a negative connotation that carries a good amount of cultural baggage with it. And we will talk about that because we're going to see what the sources are. What are the roles that were given to these uh, individuals? Okay. So, how do we know anything about history? And, and, and why are there conflicts? Uh, first of all, one of the roles that was given to the Pharisees in some of the evidence is that they were a sect or a philosophical school, along with the Sadducees, along with the Essenes. They are usually mentioned as a philosophical sect. And I know that you've already covered some of this information and material. The Pharisees are important to us in the history of Judaism because they are considered by later rabbis who are dominant in Judaism to be their precursors. That means that the rabbis, when tracing their history back, look at the Pharisees as their ancestors. The Pharisees are known to us also from the early Christian literature as plain and simple, the enemies of Jesus. But it is a little bit more complex when we look at the evidence itself. They are also known as the administrators of the state. So they have, what we will see, is a political uh, purpose within, within the uh, time period that we're studying. When we do a critical reading of sources, and our sources are rabbinic literature, Josephus the Historian, and the New Testament. When we read these sources critically, we have to ask a few questions. Qui bono? Who is served by this particular evidence, by this document? Who is served by it? What is the tendency? What is the bias of the document? What is the bias of the source? Every source has a bias. That much I guarantee you. What is the genre? Is it a poem? In which case, are we going to use that as a poem, as a historical source? Uh, what is the purpose of this document? Is it to convince people? Is it to attack people? How does it work? What is its timeliness? And as I said at the outset, if you wish to really, really expand on what we're covering and great depth, the book that I recommend for you is a wonderful, slim little book called From Politics to Piety by Professor Jacob Neusner. He wrote this book as a condensation, a condensation of three volumes of studies that he had earlier written. Now, when I say a critical reading, we, are, we want to be critical. I want to give you an aside because, of course, it's always relevant to give you something timely to our present day. Who, are, who we might ask, are the 21st century Palestinians? It's a good question. Who are the Palestinians? Do we have a universal <coughs> agreement on who they were? Uh, clearly, not really. I mean, we know who they are physically, we may know their names, but are they freedom fighters? Some sources. Are they hypocritical terrorists? Obviously, other sources. Are they religious martyrs? Certainly, we're going to have evidence to that effect. And if we're going to be looking at it, are they administrators of a state? Are they all of these? How do we study this particular group of people? By the way, Pharisees, Palestinians, uh, there's no cognate here between the, the words, but believe me, um, there's something in the water of the Middle East that has caused the continual unrest over the centuries. I don't know what it is, but 
obviously, the need for critical questions is very significant. One of the earlier writers on the uh, issue of the Pharisees was a professor from this particular campus, uh, Professor Morton Smith, who wrote a number of early critical studies. And if you're going to go into this discipline for graduate work, you'll undoubtedly uh, come up against his uh, a very well-known uh, figure here. Uh, he said about the Pharisees that they were a small group of Palestinian Jews, and he emphasized small, uh, that they were, from the evidence that he examined, a philosophical school with distinct beliefs and practices. And he pointed to Josephus' writings as evidence of that. He also pointed out that they had oral traditions, which was not something that was always taken for granted. Um, and so, our first source, our first source for who the Pharisees are is the historian Josephus. So they talk about these same people, the Pharisees. The writings themselves date from a century or more after the period, 100, 150 years after the period. So having his actual writings is good. He was, however, uh, a historian with a particular purpose. He was an apologist uh, for Rome, which means that he had to make a kind of peace treaty with Rome, as, as, uh, as was practical for his purposes. And, of course, it's interesting to note that he claimed to be a Pharisee, and he said, well, what does that mean? It means that I was a member of some kind of sect that's sort of like the Stoic school. Why would he compare it to the Stoic school? Because he was writing for a very uh, Greek uh, Hellenistic audience. Josephus' writings are, are diverse, but he speaks about the Pharisees in two particular places. In his book called The War, which describes the revolt against Rome and the war that, that led to the destruction of the temple, and that led to the end of the independent uh, uh, Judean state. Um, he talks about the, the Pharisees as if they were a political party. Uh, that's important. And uh, that's, his, that's, that's certainly his emphasis. He talks about the Pharisees as, as having had a history. Going back to the time of the Maccabees, they were active in the court affairs of the Maccabean state. Uh, and that's also very important. He mentions names and dates and rulers and intrigues that they were involved in. He also talks about them as being excellent in religion, in religious affairs. So they weren't just secular administrators, but they had an, a, a very deep uh, set of rituals and observances and beliefs. Statesman, and this is Josephus's evidence in the war. Josephus, however, also wrote further uh, about the Pharisees, and where where he mentions the fact that they were politically active in Herod's court, where he mentions them as a philosophical school, as well, and that's important because he's trying to explain, just as I would try to explain to you. Uh, in, in contemporary terms, give you an, anal an, an analog to something going on in our world. He's trying to explain to this Greco-Roman Greek reading uh, audience who these people are. And we do this all the time. We translate things in our culture into a kind of Protestant language so that we can understand what's going on elsewhere in the world. And that's a very difficult thing to do, especially when it comes to religious affairs. Well, he, he does give a specific kind of philosophical analysis, saying that the Pharisees talk a lot about faith and God. He also says that they believe that there is such a thing as a soul, and that there is also reward and punishment that is attributed to that soul. So there is a religious faith that underlies this, these, these people. And he also says they're affectionate and harmonious. Well, why is that important? Well, well, obviously, you know, you can't really say that historically about a people. Um, but when you're on their side, uh, or when you're trying to be positive,
inevitably dispose to them for one reason or another. You're going to make comments like that. So it reveals his particular bias. Um, uh, naturally, we hear statements about whether Mr. Sharon or Mr. Arafat are nice people. I mean, really, it doesn't matter whether they're nice people. But when someone says they are or they're not, we, it sort of reveals to us who they favor. Okay, and, uh, and that, that's indicative. So that, that raises a flag for us. Josephus, 20 years later, after the war, after the destruction, after the Roman uh, 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 outcome, where there's clearly a, a dominance and uh, he has chosen his side, he says about the Pharisees a little bit more and a little bit more detail. He says, all prayers and sacred rites of worship, 20 years later he says, are now performed according to the Pharisees exposition of how things ought to be done. So they become the kind of normative religious leaders. He says that they had a tremendous influence during their time in the temple. And so obviously this, well this could cut both ways, but this seems to be an important positive. He says things that are very different about the Pharisees than what he said in the earlier book that he wrote, The War. Now Martin Smith concludes from this and the Pharisees were now, 20 years after the war, the leading candidates for Roman support. And that means that they were negotiating with Rome as the representatives of the Palestinian people. That doesn't sound right. As the representatives of the people in Palestine at the time. Okay? So that's important. We know we can conclude a few things. We can conclude a fact, and that is that they were a political party, whether we like that or uh, not, and that they were at the same time a philosophical school. So that in the area of uh, our concern, there's there, there can be both. It's a complex situation. Now, as I said, there are three elements of, three main elements of evidence about the Pharisees. The first, Josephus, a an historian. The second is the New Testament writings, and in particular, the gospel literature. And again, Professor Siegel's uh, much, uh, he's much more of an expert in these materials than I, uh, but uh, we all in our PhD training have had to master not only ancient Jewish, but ancient Greco-Roman and ancient Christian sources as well. So I'm going to deal with a little bit of the material on the Pharisees and the Gospels because that's our second primary basket of evidence. Who were they according to the Gospels? mentioned? They mentioned frequently? Who were they? Who were these people? What was their nature? And here we come to a very, very different viewpoint. Not politicians or philosophers, but they are represented as something else. And in this case, the terminology that's been used by scholars to describe the picture of the Pharisees in the Gospels is that they were a table Fellowship. What does a table fellowship mean? It means a group whose coherence is reinforced by getting together and having meals and having particular practices around those meals. So in this case, one of the most prominent practices would be the set of dietary rules and regulations. If you have such, then you can eat with your like-minded group members and you cannot eat with those who are not like-minded to your group. Um, they also observe that uh, dietary laws are not hard for you to understand because, I mean, you're, regardless of how well-versed you are in the history of uh, antiquity, you do know that, in, you know, we have neighbors, whether they be uh, Orthodox or conservative Jews or Muslims or uh, Hindus, uh, who have particular dietary practices down to our own particular day. So, the 
This is not something that's so difficult for us to conceive of. However, the ritual purity aspect is a little bit more difficult because we don't have a good motivation for that. What do you mean ritual purity? They observe laws of ritual purity. And what that means is they believe, very simply, there were sources in the world around them that caused them to become unclean. Not physically, but mystically unclean. And that they would have to avoid that uncleanness in order to partake of food or participate in rituals. Now this is usually associated with the temple. And so, if I go out in the street and say that I have to avoid becoming unclean, I can't come in contact with those things that render me unclean, then I am acting as if I am going to go into the temple to perform the special rites of the temple, which requires a higher level of cleanness, of spiritual cleanness. Okay, what causes uncleanness? Okay, so just to give you an idea, although I'm not going to go into this as a great... Um, excursus here, just to give you an idea, I mean, a dead body, all right, death, a dead, a corpse is a source of uncleanness. So if you come in contact with a corpse, which is something that we don't necessarily do, but you have to understand the worlds apart from us do, uh, then and you could become ritually unclean. You can't participate in the rituals that require cleanness. Okay? A dead creeping thing, although not as significant as a dead human corpse, a dead creeping thing can impart uncleanness and therefore you cannot partake of certain foods that require cleanness. Right? And the idea that you have cleanness rituals is something a little bit uh, different. That's why I, I dwell on it a little. So they act like priests in the temple and they're also scrupulous about giving agricultural gifts. And we refer to that as the tithes, the heave offerings and the tithes. Tithing means a tenth, which was given to the Levites, uh, all a tenth, a kind of a tax that was given to the temple, to the priests and the Levites in the temple. So these are the characteristics that are mentioned in passing in the gospel about the Pharisees. However, I, we have to quickly move on to how they refer to these things. Are they positive? No. There is a great deal of antagonism in the Gospels to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are not just friendly neighbors. They are, in many cases, they're the enemies of Jesus. Now, whether they were real enemies of Jesus or whether they were the rhetorical enemies of Jesus is something that's beyond our capability of knowing. We also know that they are attributed importance. They are central to the governance of the Jewish community. So there's a secondary characteristic. They're not just enemies, but they're important people. And we also know the New Testament is not at all uh, ashamed to tell us what they think of the Pharisees. They're the enemies, they're hypocrites, and a brood of vipers. So hence the term Pharisee, don't go over to someone and say, hey, Pharisee, uh, because it has taken on that cultural meaning through the real dominance of the New Testament literature uh, in our world, in our Western world, at least. So, actually, in, in looking at the, the New Testament evidence, there are five different roles, which I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize briefly for you, that the Pharisees play. They're all pretty much... Uh, related to the same theme. But they're, they're somewhat different. One role is that they're the background enemies of Jesus. Jesus is struggling to create, obviously, to create a new sect, a new religion, and he is, in a, he is a fighter in the Gospels. He is definitely struggling. And, and it's a dramatic story. The reason Christianity is such an important and successful religion is because it is so dramatic.
between an existing group of a dominant existing kind of religious atmosphere and something that is new. That's the way it appears. There's something that is struggling for recognition against enemies, against those who wish that it would go away. So you're right. I mean, you know, we have to be careful how we state things. But they, they, they end up being described as follows. So maybe this will answer your question. They're, they're, they end up being described as a chief, uh, with, with the chief priests and the Pharisees together, grouped together. So the priests and the Pharisees are kind of background antagonists of Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees are mentioned in other sources at, together as background enemies of Jesus. And a lot of the narratives talk about how these, these opponents try to trip Jesus up or provoke him. And obviously there are many passages that take this on as a, as a principle. There's a second group where the Pharisees criticize Jesus, second group of, of uh, uh, evidence where the Pharisees are, let, let me put it to you this way, let me retreat a little bit. There's a second group where the document portrays the Pharisees as criticizing Jesus. We don't know what happened. Historically. These events are not this is meant to be historical. They're meant to be emblematic. But there's a second group where he is criticized for the following. Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. Forbidden. He violates their practices. He violates the rules and regulations of the Pharisees. Bad. There's, a gen there's another set of of pericopi, of traditions, where there's a general condemnation of, uh, of uh, Jesus as uh, antagonistic, and of the Pharisees as antagonistic to Jesus. And I'll give you one brief quote here, which is a, a pretty good quote. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does that say to you? says to you a lot of things. I like some of these things because they're, they're very pithy. They tell us a lot of things all at once. They tell us, what's the purpose of my message here? My message is that I want to help you get into the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? That's another, that's another sermon. Okay, but you, you, you followers of mine already know what the kingdom of heaven is. And righteousness is the way, is the path. And the Pharisees appear to be righteous, don't they? Other places, in other places, uh, the Gospels portray the Pharisees as being very righteous in their actions. They wear broad phylacteries to fill in that are not just little ones, but very broad so that everyone can see how religious they are. So their righteousness is apparent, and they portray themselves that way. But unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, then you will not get into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the complexity of the sources is such that there are some sources where the early Christians, where Jesus is meant to uh, be portrayed as a very positive to the Pharisees. They are, after all, a dominant group during this period of time. So, as Paul says in Acts, and this is a controversial statement, which is open to many interpretations. I am a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. So someone is saying about Paul that he is associated with the Pharisee, the Pharisee movement. But uh, I jump in and say, this is really not valued as historical information about his actual membership card. If you looked in his wallet, Paul's mem membership cards might not have, have had a you know, Pharisee in good standing membership card there. Uh, it was, after all, a narrative convention. Because it's a good thing to say. Here's the leading Christian spokesman of the day, and where did he start out from? From uh, being a Pharisee. So there's hope for everyone. Okay, so, as a narrative convention, it's very clever. As historical information,
information we don't know. The Pharisees are, after all, condemned, and they are condemned for specific beliefs and practices. Uh, uh, they, they condemn Jesus for eating with the wrong people because they would never eat with those people. And Jesus says he would eat with those people, taxpayers and sinners, and the Pharisees would not. The Pharisees, we are told, fast. They have many fast days, so they are religiously pious in that way. The early, the early Christians, those, the, the circle of Jesus does not. The Pharisees do not harvest food on the Sabbath, and the early Christians don't have any qualms about that. If you're hungry, you go out and pluck yourself something and have something to eat, even if it's the Sabbath. Pharisees are very strict. They don't even heal. If someone is ill on the Sabbath, they won't even mix the healing potions to heal that person. That's how their ritual overcomes their humanity. And it's a, it's a very uh, clear attack on Pharisaism. Christians, however, are criticized by the Pharisees because they don't keep Ritual purity, they don't understand. They're supposed to wash their hands before they eat their foods. They don't understand the needs of ritualism. And there's a great deal of, the last segment of these materials is the moral condemnation of the Pharisees by the uh, early Christian literature. And that's quite clear. The moral condemnation of Pharisees and Pharisaism is the Pharisees keep ritual purity laws, but neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. So that obviously uh, they are misguided at best. They look and appear to be very religious, but they are misguided at best. So there are three issues to conclude. The New Testament Pharisees kept the Sabbath, they kept ritual purity, and they kept tithing. Even though we know that they don't like the Pharisees, the early Christian writers uh, of the Gospels do tell us some valuable information about who these people really were. It seems to me we could distill that out from this body of evidence, that they at least were 